Okay. Um, so then we'll hit the, the last part of the discussion, and this is going to get us a little bit more into um, MRV, and then we'll talk a little bit about these guys on NAMAs. Okay. So as I mentioned to you, some of the critical milestones in the negotiations um, were not only Kyoto, uh, but uh, Bali. Okay, so uh, Bali had a COP meeting or Conference of the Parties meeting uh, in 2007. Um, it was uh, one of the more interesting uh, COPs um, because out of this meeting came what's known as the uh, Bali Action Plan or the Bali Roadmap. Uh, and the reason it was interesting is there was a recognition at this time that um, for developing countries in particular, this, uh, the CDM mechanism was nice, uh, but it wouldn't be able to capture all of the sectors that we needed to take a look at, and not only uh, all the sectors, but it wouldn't capture larger programs of action, well, or larger policies. Um, and so focusing only on projects was going to be sort of just too piecemeal. Um, so there was a, an effort to try to define a way that developing countries could participate in the climate change regime, but at the same time recognizing that because they're still developing, they wouldn't be able to take on hard targets and timetables. Um, and so there was an emphasis on trying to figure out a more bottom-up way to participate. The agreement that came out of Bali, as I mentioned, is called the Bali Action Plan. And a key line in the Bali Action Plan refers to these uh, nationally appropriate mitigation actions, or NAMAs. And basically what the line said is developing countries will take or can take nationally appropriate mitigation actions in the context of sustainable development, so putting the emphasis on sustainable development. Uh, and some of these will qualify for finance, technology, and capacity building in a measurable, reportable, and verifiable manner. When this language was approved, um, there was a lot of discussion between the different negotiators over whether or not this measurable, reportable, and verifiable applied to the nationally appropriate mitigation actions. So do we need to MRV the NAMAs, or do we need to MRV the finance, technology, and capacity building that's supposed to help those NAMAs? Um, and the sort of consensus these days is actually both. So um, since the uh, COP13 in Bali, we've had another series of COPs, as I mentioned to you. Uh, Copenhagen was a very big meeting. Um, there was expectation coming into that meeting that we'd have a very, very nice comprehensive climate change agreement. Whereas in the past, 10,000 people usually go to these meetings. In Copenhagen, there were 40,000. And outside of the meeting, you had lots of protesters. Um, inside of the meeting, the, many people felt the results were a little bit disappointing. Um, but gradually over time, what we've been able to do is set up this structure where we have three different types of NAMAs. One type of NAMAs are what are called unilateral. That means that those are actions that are taken by the countries themselves that are financed by the countries themselves. Okay? And so there's no external support. And the rules for MRVing in the, the, that case um, there's been a, a lot of discussion back and forth over whether those rules should be set at the international level or whether they should be set at the uh, national level. And they've set up some language to suggest that there'll be some guidance or some international consultation analysis to help MRV those unilateral NAMAs. The supported NAMAs um, refer to different actions that will get international support and the key thing for these actions is um, rather than having that support linked to how much GHG you reduce and your baseline, rather than having that type of setup, the support will be more like a development assistance project. The amount of money that we'll actually get for these supported NAMAs will, be, will depend upon the needs of the, the country, the needs to help finance this NAMA, um, and some other criteria besides the GHGs. Still need to MRV the GHGs, but that's not going to be the key determinant um, in how much money you get. 
these supported namas are probably one of the best opportunities for the transportation sector. The last set of namas refer to accredited namas, and these are supposed to work very similar to the CDM, but maybe at a larger scale, where the actual amount of fin finance you get is indexed or is set in line with the amount of GHGs that you um, reduce. And the MRV rules for the supported and credited are being negotiated, um, but there's an effort to make them um, more relevant to the sector that we're talking about. The money for these things to help support um, these NAMAs, from 2010 to 2012, there was what is set up, what is known as a fast start financing or fast track financing. Um, and the uh, total amount was supposed to be 30 billion US dollars over that three year period. Um, and basically from 2012 to 2020, there's been no concrete agreement on how much finance will come in that period. But the um, agreement is to have $100 billion per year by 2020. And the idea is to gradually scale up to that amount uh, between 2012 and 2020. Um, and some of this finance will be allocated by this new fund they're calling a Green Climate Fund. Um, and the negotiations in Warsaw and negotiations next year in uh, Lima, Peru, and negotiations the year after that in Paris will have a lot of emphasis on this Green Climate Fund. So one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is if transportation is going to get a larger share of this money than CDM, then we need to think very closely about how we can MRV some of the things that are actually going on in cities right now. So when you talk about your examples of non-motorized transport, we need to think innovatively and creatively about how we can MRV those things. So moving forward, they'll qualify for some type of um, funding. Um, and uh, this just shows you the Green Climate Fund. It demonstrates that from 2013 to 2015, there's been basically the same type of pledges, uh, $10 billion each year. Um, and the other thing that I want to underline here as well is in this period right now between 2012 and 2020, um, there are other mechanisms out there to acquire finance. Uh, so for instance, Japan has set up their own bilateral mechanism. And Toto will talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, but all of these mechanisms uh, will require some type of MRV. Um, and then this is just to highlight some of the namas that we've seen. So um, Indonesia actually moved very quickly in uh, pledging its nama in 2009-2010. It's a 26% reduction off of business as usual. Um, but that can be raised to 41% uh, with international support. And the reduction or the NAMA, the plan, as you can see right here, has a transportation element. And once again, my colleague Toto will talk a little bit more about this. But um, the NAMA is actually now being integrated or being brought down to the city level. So there needs to be greater coordination between the city level and then this, this national level pledge. Um, then just a few last points to highlight here about MRV. Um, the whole idea of MRV for transportation uh, is not, uh, not new. Um, there's been an emphasis on looking at development impacts of transportation projects that goes back over 100 years. Um, many of the recent interests uh, is located in 1950s, where we began to look at um, what they would call the um, origin and destination um, um, matrix, looking at the relationship between where people left and where they arrived, and then trying to understand um, how much energy was used during that process and what the other impacts on the transportation system were. Um, we see this in 1980 when the US introduces um, an executive order for cost benefit analysis. This would also apply to transportation projects. And much of the sort of recent interest in MRV in the transportation sector, then it gets us linked back a little bit to ASI, this avoid, shift, improve. So the avoid, shift, improve came from another idea known as ASIF, or as if, which was introduced by a uh, scholar I mentioned previously, Lee Shipper. And this ASIF will be sort of the backbone 
that you guys will use to think about MRV in the transportation sector. It stands for activity, structure, fuel intensity, and emission factors. So activity, structure, fuel intensity with the I, and emission factor with the F. We'll talk about that in more detail. But this is probably the approach that will be applied to transportation NAMAs too. Um, this is slightly different than the typical way that uh, transportation emissions have been MRV'd, especially at the international level. Um, the international level, we've seen a strong emphasis on more top-down MRV. What that means is a lot of times they'll look at the total amount of fuel that's used in a country and multiply it times some emissions factor, and that will give you your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's, that's good, but obviously from a city's perspective, you don't only want to know um, about the total amount of fuel, you want to know about the activity, the structure, the energy intensity, and the fuel, or the as if. Um, and once again, we'll talk a little bit more detail about how you actually apply that to transportation emissions in a bit. But this allows you to look at some of the levers or some of the key points that you want to target to reduce those emissions um, in, far, in terms of activity, structure, intensity, and fuel. And then just to conclude, um, the next major challenge I think for a lot of us, as I mentioned at the beginning, is if we want to use this as-if approach, data is going to be a really big challenge. So this graph right here just shows you the difference in uh, data between um, uh, the number of vehicles and, uh, excuse me, the number of vehicles in Jakarta um, according to the Metro Traffic Police versus the Tax Revenue Office. As you can see, there's a pretty significant difference there. And a lot of times this comes down to the way that we count vehicles, the surveys that we use. Um, and uh, so one of, these things, one of the issues is going to be trying to, to reduce these, this divergence. OK, then just the last part. So once again, the Bali Action Plan began to change the nature of climate change regime. It became more about pledging your own actions. Um, it allowed countries to pledge NAMAs, or Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Actions. Some of these will qualify for support from international climate regime or other institutions. And then MRV will be an important requirement of what could be an increasingly diverse sources, uh, increasingly diverse sources of finance under the Green Climate Fund, but also perhaps under other bilateral mechanisms too. And then this is just uh, thank you. Um, and this just illustrates some of the work that we're doing at IGES. Um, we have a partnership on co-benefits. And you can join by going to www.cobenefit.org. And we recently wrote a book on low carbon transport, which has a chapter on Bandung, um, and also uh, a manual on uh, measuring co-benefits. Um, and some of that work actually will filter into our discussions later on. So, Thank you for bearing with me, and uh, we're, down, we're done with the, um, this session. Yeah.